What is up down at Sideways, you beautiful individuals? It is League Unlock. We are back. Eric and Mark here with you from the other side of a bit of a wacky weekend of action. The final quarter, final qualifications, and it was a rough time to be a fan of the LEC. It started so good early on with the Fnatic versus Cloud9. You say, ha, ah, CEU is greater than NA. Then we had the... I guess you'll call it an upset, slight upset, the NRG versus G2, and things only got worse from there, Mark. Oh my goodness. Week 2 NA, it has transferred to Week 2 EU at the Swiss stage for the World Championship. It is a biggest consequence for G2 Esports. Yes, they miss out on making it through to the top eight, and it all starts with that upset against NRG, NRG pulling it off, making things happen, making the plays, making everything happen across the map. And it is G2 that has a bad day, can't catch up, can't compete with NA's number one team. And your consequence for not being able to handle what was considered at the time, of course, a favorable draw. And I think even in hindsight, giving credit to NRG, still, that favorable draw, the most favorable option for G2 to get this ticket out of here from promotions. Your consequence is you got to face up against BLG and squaring up right up against Mr. Gigabin in the top side. We've spent two, almost three months hyping up Broken Blade as the answer for the West in the top lane. And the last series for G2 at Worlds absolutely gapped in the top side. Letting Bin get Jax even in game one is a little bit egregious for what this guy's done a couple of years. But then he's doing it on the Renekton styling on you. And this was the biggest top gap BB has been on the wrong side of basically all year, which is unfortunate. And it felt like in this BLG series and even the NRG one, all the things, all the picks that we were praising G2 for in EU were the issues in these series. It never came through, really, to see the power, to see the you know the way that they were able to work with them within the LEC on this type of stage right now in Korea never came through. And I think really the big thing to look at with Broken Blade and the disappointment is obviously, again, still continued into that NRG series where Dokla, Big Dokes, is taking mega advantage of over in like Broken Blade, which... You know, you really look into the history of someone like Dokla, you can find some of these results back in the LCS. You know, that, but that's a while ago at this point. BB has evolved. He's leveled up. He's learned things with G2. And we really saw that this year and some extra lessons sprinkled in from MSI to really try and tune yourself up for this world championship. And it all came crashing down. This is one of the most dominant performances in the top lane that we have ever seen in the LEC. And once again, doesn't stack up to the international competition and not just the international competition your western competition it didn't even stack up to this time really unfortunate performance this feels like one of the first times we're talking about an iteration of g2 that feels like they went a bit mental boom here these last two series especially i don't know if it's something that happened in that gen g set because all the behind the scenes we were hearing was G2 looked like a legit strong team for top four to buy against some of these Eastern teams. We saw them in the first two games doing it, and then it just completely fell off the rails, and it felt like this team quickly became a shell of what we had seen only a week ago. I have no idea what happened behind the scenes, but never to my recollection have I seen a G2 roster do this. No, it is really strange, especially, you know, led captain by mr caps in the mid lane to see something like this go through is not something we've seen from g2 before it's it's one of those questions where do you go from here if you are g2 because this new roster retooled around you know a youngster yike in the jungle and everything else really hit their stride in the lec and show that they can be this dominant top tier type team and you have to now take that look inwards. Is this a squad that can fix the mistakes, is going to be accountable moving forward to change the course of this history? Or is this really the max of what you got with this right now? And do you need to hit that drawing bar once again? And again, the first series, it feels like internationally or really domestically, where you're looking at Yike and saying, ah, this wasn't it. The guy who's been the star standout player all year, he was... He was kind of invisible in this BLG series. And let's be honest, he was gapped by contracts in the NRG set. 
Giga Gapped by Mr. El Contracto in the Jungle for NRG. It's a disappointment one, sure. It's an understandable one given his inexperience. These you forget of he's a rookie. He's been good, so good all year. Absolutely, and he's been so good in those crucial clutch type of moments that you thought, okay, maybe the moment won't get to him. I think it did, is the way that you got to look at what these performances are, and, and especially the way that, you know, his component is able to play in comparison. And I think that especially with the champs that were being selected towards the end for G2, kind of reflected, not necessarily having that confidence, having that aggression that we want to see, that we know is that ticket to success for Yike and G2. And now immediately I've seen the pivot that everyone said, well, it's because Look, G2 looks so dominant in EU for two out of the three splits plus the season finals. The competition's not high enough in EU, obviously, if they're dominating everybody and then they come internationally and do not even make top eight. And I know everyone loves to bring up 2019. They were tested by this elite fanatic team that was pushing them every time. And yes, I think to some level, I think we've talked about all year that the upper power level of EU is not the highest that it's been but I mean G2 was looking good for the first week of Worlds and things were working out so I don't think that that's the issue no and I mean it's it's tough because you look at you know going through you know Romain's tweets that he's just put out right now from G2 talking about you know 230 plus days of scrims and hours all these blocks and he'll release the full information to everybody when they get back so they can fully detail and see where the hours were spent where this practice is and understand this isn't just Western teams being lazy and all these other type of, you know, baloney type of excuses that come through. We've dealt with the same conversation with TSMs in the past, talking about the regions not strong enough to challenge them, to harden them, get them ready for these events. They have to focus different, all these type of things. With G2's preparation, they were already doing that. So to fail at this point, it's a different, uh, you know, place you got to point that finger and try to turn it around. And I mean, you can talk, you can talk about the mentality. We've seen NRG is the top one. G2 pushing the Western team saying, you got to believe that you can do well at this tournament, not just come in as the massive underdog into every matchup. And NRG said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's take that approach and then turn it over on G2. So maybe they have stolen that magic that G2 had because it felt like G2 had that energy early that they legitimately felt like they could beat any team at this event. I mean, if you were to tell me before the game happened that it was some type of Space Jam magic where they were able to steal away that type of mojo from G2 and that's the type of performance we saw, I'd believe it at that type of point because, yes, that type of swagger, that type of confidence out there on the rift from NRG, number one, finally showing a bit of that swagger of, yeah, we are a number one seed. We won our region, put a little bit of respect, even if it is the LCS right there. And then, yes, that attitude against not even, you know, uh, Eastern squad teams, even against a squad like G2, where you're considered that underdog, that type of mentality that, you know, do or die, never say quit. You saw that come through from NRG. Thank you, G2 for instilling that type of mentality or showing that that is a possibility for Western teams and blessed NRG for taking it up. You could get a shout out to G2 on that championship trophy. Oh. That NRG's hoisting it, you know, uh, saying thanks for changing our view on everything. Unfortunately, the other LEC matchup was, no one was really expecting Fnatic to actually beat Weibo. But we've seen this before with EU teams. They go up 1-0 and they're in control. I saw the path to a 2-0 Fnatic victory. But then it was that pesky purple worm that EU has not had a fun time with at this event. No, no, no. You're. This is NA week two. It's continuing. It's infesting even deeper into EU. Dignitas the is showing up. No. The Dignitas burger flips rolling on through a crucial, critical, and painful moment for Fnatic as they lose this one to Weibo. And then obviously you move into game three and we have this whole conversation around the draft and the picking of Alistar as the support locked in for Fnatic. The support that was Trimby taking the choice of Alistar, from what I understand. And Noah, then he's face palming. So what's going on? Maybe he's face palming because then his ADC says, "Oh, I was actually looking to be paired with a Blitzcrank into this Kate Lux yeah, lane I'm gonna that go we're ahead going and feed through." This one now, so. 
Blitzcrank seems to fit quite a bit better in my mind than throwing down an Alistar in that type of position into a lane of Kate Lux. There's nothing good that's going to come out of that one with an Alistar. And unfortunately, that is only the start of the problems in that game three for Fnatic. Yeah, I mean, the Alistar is, you're basically 1v2 in that lane as Noah, and you see him get down 30 CS almost immediately. And we know this is what Caitlyn Lux does. You, you don't get to play the lane unless you can hard engage on them. And an Alistair is never even going to be able to walk up to a Lux Caitlyn. So that is a whole debacle in itself. We'll see what the details come out, whether or not it was Trimby saying, I want this Alistair. What he's, it's crazy that he's even hovering Blitzcrank and Pike. Like, oh, you want this? You want this? I know, we're going Alistair. So I need, I need the voice comp straight in that big bit. I mean, hovering over them is almost like showing exactly what you don't want to see if you're the side of Waymo, and then all of a sudden, hey, the, the easiest thing possible for Great. us right now. Crazy, crazy to think that it ends like that for Fnatic, because you know what? In that first game and up to that point of the Baron, they did show that they were one of these teams that can take that next step. Is someone that you could, you know, I, I you think about all these possible opportunities, matchups that might play out for them moving forward. And before you get to that point, of course, the Baron is stolen and then the whole series swips around. And you saw in this series alone, the two-sided coin of Humanoid and Humanoid uh, coming in. Some 1v2 dies uh, versus Zhao, who, who is low-key, not low-key, full-key, the best mind controller at this event. When did he become a Jedi? What's going on here, my man, with the mind tricks? First, he gets Palafox, clever genius. Now he's rolling through Humanoid. This is something else. Xiaohu is definitely one of these major key parts of the machine that works for Weibo Gaming, getting themselves out of usually some sticky situations is part of what he has been good for this team to do. And he definitely finds a way to get that going for Weibo in the series. And let's be honest, Weibo hasn't really played that well yet this whole tournament. They've just been blessed enough to have a matchup. Look at who they've played, Mark. NRG. G2, KT Rolster, okay, a couple tough matches there. Mad Lions, Fnatic, and now they're drawing NRG again? They haven't had to play near 100%, or they're getting smashed by KT. Which, hey, shout out to the rest of the North American fans that were alongside me crossing your fingers going, please, Weibo, please, Weibo, for that NRG matchup. Probably the only opportunity that NRG would have had out of this top well, eight. It's a 3-0 against any other of the six teams, for sure. You, you know, we can we can change that probably to a definitely not a good situation if you're not getting Weibo if you are NRG. This is what can happen with the Swiss stage. You can get a draw like KT Rolster where you're smix, smix, smack, not getting any North American, no EU teams, no matter what. Or you get a Weibo where you're getting, that's pretty much all that you're getting type of situation. This is something that I think obviously when we look back, the event when it's all over we can talk about different little ways you can tweak through different little rules different little things that can avoid these type of situations can avoid an overwhelmingly lucky draw like this is for Weibo Gaming a team that hasn't necessarily shown us maybe in the past would have been one of these LPL teams that doesn't get to that type of level in time to make it out of groups this year with the type of strength of schedule they've gotten they haven't need to ramp all the way up quite yet yeah maybe there is a way you can make it I mean, it would get incredibly complicated to be having an evolving strength of schedule. Like, oh, KT's already played three Eastern teams, so they're more likely to draw a Western team. That's getting incredibly complicated. When we and, and this is draws. all understanding that, you know, still really happy with the Swiss states, with the changes that yes. have come through, and knowing that, yes, we want to tweak it through, but also being careful not to go overboard with the changes all the way to, into it. Listen, this... This happens in traditional sports too. You get unlucky draws in, in events. That's just how it works. That's that's the nature of these type of tournaments. I'd rather take the lucky and unlucky draws in this Swiss stage than the lucky and unlucky draw one single time for what your group is going to be. And then that plays itself out. Or in the quarterfinals where you're going home. Quarterfinals, <laughs> drawing, you know, somebody rough. But uh, that's... That's just the nature of the chaos that is this Swiss stage. Uh, last matchup that was over on the Sunday is, as we've been alluding to, the deadly road that KT Rolster had. And the poor LCK got another Civil War matchup with KT and D+. But this one, 
was pretty damn convincing. KT, even though having the hardest road to get through top eight, said no worries. D+, plus, we beat him once already. We've beaten up on them all year in the LCK. Let's do it again. Even with a couple of sparkles, a couple of glimpses of what you wanted to see from D plus Kia. It is the overwhelming power and control from KT Rolster that exists once again. You saw it all the way through the LCK play. Every time these two teams would match up, you saw it again in this series really is that full point forward of it. I think there is a little bit of extra flash and spice that we did get to see from Def picking up a couple of kills on that Aphelios, making things interesting, but overwhelmingly at the end of the day, it's BDD, it's aiming, and let's give a shout out to Mr. Support, Mr. Lehens, making some big plays happen for KT Rolster. And how about a little bit of a rise top sighting for Keen? Always a fallback pick we've seen throughout pretty much any meta out of him. I, and I'll be honest, I was putting the question marks on it, not because I'm not, you know, familiar with Rise Top or anything like that. I didn't think this was the right opportunity to throw it in and what it was going to happen. Keen makes it work. He makes me a believer out of this one and that type of angle, that type of difference, that little bit of a twist for KT Rolster, a team that almost has no type of twist, it seems, is going to be an excellent angle as we move towards these best fives in the top eight. So D plus, I know we were feeling very good about, but it just felt like the competition leveled up. They were 2-0 in BDS, 2-0 in GAM in dominant fashion, but those are play-in teams, legit play-in teams compared to when you're matching up against KT, who has been forged in the fires of only drawing LPL and LCK teams. And historically, uh, obviously, D plus were accustomed to having deep runs at Worlds, but it feels like going forward now, this is... This is going to be a big change, and I'm talking maybe Canyon and Showmaker are getting out of here. I mean, you know, we still have to look through, kind of reading through the grapevine on what are the situations with D plus Kia, but there was a recent interview with Deft, and he was talking about, yeah, there's lots of issues with the team and figuring, you know, communication and what we want to settle on and be on the same page and everything, and that includes deft in that conversation he was talking about i'm not always you know i'm not the perfect guy i'm not the obvious answer everything else so it was a whole team issue thing that needed to be sorted and solved through now that moves into the offseason type of picture and as you said that raises even more questions revolving what happens what is this picture of damn one because if this thing gets blown up gets shipped apart there are some amazing pieces to get out of this one if you are one of these other teams around the world it's strange because so often squads we talk about they're greater than the sum of their parts d plus felt the opposite like they have five individually talented players but it never felt like the synergy of them as a team was able to come online and you could you can get the best musicians with the best instruments and all this type of thing if they're playing different types of music it's not really gonna jam and gel type of thing and i think that's what we saw overall too many times too often for this d plus kia team to find their success KT knocks them down, finds themselves in that top eight. And you know what? Let's let's put the respect on KT because we've said they had such a difficult road. BLG, D+, Weibo, LNG in the first best of. Then they get a rematch against D+, where they look dominant. Historically, I, I think people would be picking KT to not be taking top eight with this road, but they have shown the glory of the past or the curses of the past are no more unfortunately obviously they drive jdg immediately in quarters but if they somehow come away with that win they are absolved of all previous curses and torment uh, and this is just the way things go for kd rolster this type of luck there was no other way we get from them picking t1 in the summer playoffs all the way to them now, all of a sudden you got JDG in your top eights for Worlds. This is the timeline that we're traveling through here. I want to take a quick second to give a shout out, some props to Mr. Cuz in the jungle for KT because yeah. I don't think enough people are giving Cuz his props is due on what he's been able to do. He Because we have seen so many fantastic jungle performances at this event. That is more than fair. But put Cuz's name in that type of list of guys that are performing at an ultra high level. It's going to take an ultra high level out of Cuz to be equal to the task of what Kanavi's got going for JDG. If I'm picking one jungler that I need to get me a 50-50 smite, it's probably because of this tournament right now. It is. It's got to be, my man. He has been smooth with those smites. We love him. Consistent, true, and clean. Getting them off is the big one for me. This matchup, KT versus JDG, kind of out of all the options that were there, 
I think this was going to be the most competitive. This was going to be that option out of the, you know, tier three team, whatever type of situation that could have been drawn into JDG that can give us this type of matchup. You got to be looking back into the LCK summer. How good, how lethal KT could be. You got to stack that up against the very best of JDG. And I still think JDG is winning out for sure. But it's something to consider when you think back to the power that maybe you get aiming on something a little bit lucky and he's popping off and making the difference. So a quick look at, you know, moving to top eight. Now we had NRG's the only Western team, but we were damn close to maybe three Western squads. There were still moments where you thought G2 after kind of a miracle comeback in game two to win, you thought maybe they had a chance in game three. Fnatic, as we mentioned, for a game and a half looked like they were in control. So in this new format and all the harsh criticism we've had on Western teams, there was still angles where you almost had three teams making top eight. There was a chance, and I think that that's going to be the tough thing because obviously, even at the end of the day, you got to make that slice between making it and not making it type of thing. And there are consequences for that that come with it, you know, publicly from the community and internally from your own personnel and your teammates uh, working through it. This still is, I think, overall, a somewhat of a good showing, you know, better than probably average, I think for looking at the Western teams and how they've done. It's hard to quantify with the results because of the change from group stage to this Swiss stage and what that was going to mean and, and everything else. Teams like Fnatic had that chance. Teams like G2 absolutely had that chance. And even looking at some of these other North American or the Mad Lions teams, you can talk about ways that they could have turned it around if something was different, if this performance is us type of way. At the end of the day, it's obviously not. And you got to deal with it, pack it up and sit with it. We're looking at this one and we're feeling relatively okay about where we've gone with this. And obviously, a big part of that is because NRG is that one team feeling safe in the top eight. And feeling good for a top four finish, at least for them. But <laughs> it feels like there is more angles for Western teams to potentially make it out with this new Swiss stage format. We'll be back to preview all those quarterfinal matchups. But that is it today for League Unlocked. My name is Eric. That is Mark. Thank you so much for watching, as always. And we'll catch you on that flippity flip.